Hello, friends. Welcome to Heidi's Colorful Colorado. I'm your host, Heidi Ganahl, a wife, mom of four, CU Regent, and the founder of Camp Bow Wow and The She Factor. With a passion for keeping the spirit of our state alive and well, I started this podcast to bring the people of Colorado together to celebrate the amazing state we call home. Come along on this journey with me as I travel across our old country roads in my vintage RV, interviewing folks that embody the true spirit of the Rocky Mountains. From the Front Range to the Mile High City to the Wild West of Southern Colorado, we'll celebrate the history, beauty, and Coloradans that make this place the colorful state it is. Each week, you'll meet people trailblazing the way for an even more colorful future for us all, making a huge difference along the way. Are you ready for a Rocky Mountain ride? Let's do this, Colorado. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Heidi's Colorful Colorado. Today, we have a really interesting podcast. Sheriff Reams, hello. hello. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. So thankful for you taking the time to walk us through the prison and talk to us a little bit about what a sheriff does and how you got into this. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's, been, uh, it's been quite a ride. I've been doing this for 25 years, but we'll give you the Reader's Digest uh, version today. We'll kind of run a, a quick tour through the jail and kind of how the process works. Uh, this is one of three things I'm statutorily required to do. I have to run a jail, I have to keep the peace, and I have to act as the fire warden for the county. Interesting. I didn't realize yep. that. Um, Sheriff, how did you get interested in doing this? We, we, did do you want to do this as a kid? Uh, you know, my story is a little different. My, I, I came from a family there. Uh, I had a stepdad who uh, domestically abused my mom and, oh. and us kids. And uh, the cops were heroes in my life. When we would call 911, they would bring stability. And so um, you know, it was just kind of a natural draw for me to get into law enforcement, and it's been a pleasure every day since. Well, we're very grateful that you do what you do and keep us safe. My dad was a police officer on and off and a, and a volunteer sheriff in Palmer Lake, so I have a lot of respect for you guys, and I know your heart's in the right place, and you just do an amazing job of protecting our community. So I'm really interested to see this and for folks to learn more about what you do you and bet. how you keep us safe every day. Well, this is the start of where it all happens. Uh, you're looking at our back parking lot here of the Sheriff's Office Administration Building. So uh, the folks will come in each morning, the deputies will come in, they'll get basically their marching orders. We'll kind of talk about what crime is occurring uh, in and around Weld County, kind of the hot spots that they need to look after and uh, some safety tips. They'll come out and they'll load up in their cars and we won't see them again until the end of their shift uh, because the idea for a patrol deputy is to not be in the office. We want their office to be out in the community. Uh, so you very rarely will see deputies around here, just like this morning. There's hardly any cars. There's hardly anybody milling around because they're out catching the bad guys. That's great. And we'll find out where they take the bad guys here in just a little bit. Thanks. So when an arrestee gets brought to the jail, the arresting officers will get stopped at the gate. They'll report what the charges are, if the, the prisoner's combative, cooperative, whatever the case may be. Uh, we'll notify our, our deputies inside that they have an arrestee coming in and what the arresting agency is. And then they have from there to the actual arrest vestibule for our deputies to get ready to basically take over the arrest process. So kind of our little uh, ride to glory, if you will. Oh, right? I hope I don't ever have to take that I ride. I hope you don't either. <laughs> I always tell people I don't mind giving you a tour of the jail, but I would prefer that you come in through the front doors instead of the back doors. But today is a little different thing because we're kind of showing you the real route. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> So we're in the arrest vestibule of the Weld County Jail. Uh, when a prisoner gets brought in, uh, this, they'll come in through the secure door. The arresting officer will pull up here and they'll basically get out. They'll take off all their police uh, equipment that isn't allowed inside the facility. So gun, baton, um, anything that's not allowed inside of a jail. They'll lock them up in the lock boxes. Then they'll take their prisoner out of the car, bring their prisoner inside for processing. Sheriff, how many prisoners do you accept a day on average? Uh, right now we're taking about 45 a day since arrest restrictions are off. Um, since the pandemic's been declared over by Governor Polis, we, we, our doors are open. Um, so it's been about 45 prisoners every 24 hours. How many leave every day? Uh, about half that. Wow. So this is definitely a working area. So, you know, arrestees come in or uh, an arresting officer comes in with their arrestees. This is where they get processed. This is kind of the entryway into the facility. Uh, it may not look that pretty, but it's a jail, so it's meant to be functional. So they come in here and we make sure that we process them and find out if they have any contraband, anything they're not supposed to have with them, because if they go past that door with any contraband, that's another charge, okay. another criminal charge. So we're making sure for their health and safety here that they don't have any medical concerns, any mental health issues that we can't deal with inside of the facility. We process them here, we find out who they are, and they go through the next door, and they're a custody of the Weld County Jail. 
So we're inside of the booking facility here at the Weld County Jail. Um, obviously we had a very busy night, or very busy last 24 hours, so we're processing about 47 inmates this morning. Um, this is all their property uh, that has been, that will be issued to them. These are the people that will be staying. So uh, the folks that are over in this uh, little vestibule area will, will come over and get their stuff. They'll head to a housing unit. They've already been, um, they've already been medically observed. We've already made sure that there's any mental health issues. We've looked at their crime, and we're deciding what the best housing unit fit for them is. Not everybody goes into the same housing unit. They kind of get divided out by their criminal history, by their by their most recent crime, and then mentally just where they're at. Um, so it's a big process. It ha has to happen fast, and um, you know it's a continuous movement. So they'll they'll go from here to a housing unit, and we'll start the process all over for the next 24 hours. Chef Reams, what, what are in those packs? So they get very basic um, needs. They'll get a blanket, sheet, um, clothing, uh, hygiene kit, so deodorant, toothbrush, toothpaste, a comb, um, and that's basically their livelihood in those bags, and they'll, they'll use those, that's what they'll live out of hmm. inside of the cell that they'll get assigned uh, when they get down to a housing unit. Okay. So the last thing, or I shouldn't say the last thing, the first part of the process when we're, uh, when we're bringing someone in is always pictures, prints, the, the mug shot that you see in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. That gets taken right over here. Um, so they get, they get processed, they come around the corner, they go to our APHIS system where they'll be fingerprinted. Uh, they get processed to, to make sure that we have the right person mm -hmm. and to make sure that we have all their criminal charges. So there'll be a clearance done of their fingerprints, which we get back in minutes. So we know who we have, who we don't have, and what all their true criminal history is just based on, on biometrics. What percentage of time is it not accurate? Um, it's usually accurate, but if we have someone who gives a false name, yeah. uh, we know it within just a few minutes uh, from the time that they get brought into the facility. Interesting. Okay. So we're heading down to the housing unit after an inmate gets processed. Uh, they get assigned to uh, whatever housing unit based on their criminal charges. We're going into a minimum security area here, so we'll be able to kind of look in and, and see what these individual housing units look like. But this is our largest housing unit in the facility. Um, this is a minimum security male unit, so there's no locks on the actual doors. There's four to six inmates in each cell. And uh, right now, because of still trying to minimize COVID in the facility, there's not a lot of people out at any one given time. Uh, there'll be 20 inmates out at a time, even though this housing unit holds about 96. Hmm. 74 when we're only doing four man cells, 96 or so when we're doing six man cells. Okay. We can put men or women in any different housing unit. We do it based on the needs of the facility. So if we have a bunch of females in custody, we can flip a housing unit and make it a woman's, uh, a woman's pod instead of a men's. Obviously, most of our population is, is men. Um, it's about 80, 20. Is it really? So, you know, we have, we have a fair amount of females in custody. Sometimes that number uh, gives a little bit. We've been as high as 60, 40. Um, but right now we're, we're male predominant, so most of the housing units you're going to see are going to be populated with males. Okay. And we're going into the new wing of the facility, so this is a new 379 beds that were added to the facility for a total of around 1,500. Okay. Okay. So when a person gets booked into the facility, they have a right to see a judge within 48 hours. In Weld County, we actually do it within 24 hours. There's a new state law that just passed that requires uh, a 48-hour bond schedule, but we've been way ahead of that curve. So when a person gets booked in, they'll go through booking, and then they'll come to what we call the intake unit for further processing. These two units behind us that we'll see in just a second are the intake units. But once they're in the intake unit, that's where they get a chance to go to court. But court's not like what you would see on TV. <laughs> this is court. There's a video monitor. There's a judge on the other end of that monitor. And so we'll basically line inmates up as it's their turn to go to court. They step up to the desk. They talk to the judge and they get a bond set. And so they may get out, they may not, um, just depending on what their charges are and mm -hmm. what interactions they have with the judge. Great. So this is the actual intake unit and you can pan so the audience can see it. It's closed right now because they just finished processing everyone. That's who we saw down in booking. They, okay. they were getting ready to be dispersed out through the facility. So we don't keep the, the, the units open unless we need them. So after everybody's come through, they've been processed, they've been either given a chance to be released through a bond or they're gonna stay in our custody and go to a housing unit. Once that happens, we no longer need this, we'll close it down, we'll use the resource somewhere else. So this opens and closes, opens and closes based on the needs of the facility. We actually have two of these that are mirrored. So we have 
we can do males on one side, females on the other, mm -hmm. um, and we can run quite a, through, quite a few people through here. They'll hold 42 inmates, but obviously we, as fast as we can process, um, you know, we could, we could double that or triple that if we needed to. Okay. Every cell in this jail is constructed virtually the same way. They're all solid steel welded. They have two bunks. They have, uh, you know, their, the bathroom inside. And they, when we constructed this place, the cells were built off site. And we basically stacked them in here like Legos. Huh. They built an exterior wall, stacked them in here like Legos, plumbed them all together. Uh, so this housing unit and every other housing unit we'll go into will look virtually the same from the inside of the cell. It's how we plot those, those cells around and use them uh, that's important. So this gives us a lot of flexibility. We can hold from maximum security to minimum security as long as uh, they're all constructed the same. There's two beds in almost every one. Uh, some of the handicap, well, so in those Pretty big small, dormitory you guys. style housing units. This would be tight. This is where you spend all your time. So the minute that an inmate comes into the facility, if they're, especially when they're first arrested, our goal is to give them the, as many opportunities as they can to get out if, if they've been given a bond. So we're gonna give them as much access to the phone as, as they can get. Um, because if, if they can get out, we want them out. Yeah. What's the temperature? Like, how does the temperature work in the cells? What if somebody likes cold, somebody likes hot? Is there any adjustment or is Not everything the same? We set everything at about 72 degrees yeah. and it's that way year round. Interesting. So. Yeah, it's, there's not a lot of creature comforts. Uh, <laughs> there's no room service. Uh, they can push a button on the inside of their cell if there's an emergency. The officer will come to the door. But uh, obviously, if they're abusing that privilege, then that becomes a secondary issue. Okay. So if they're going to meet with their attorney, they're on one side, ah. and on the other. Yeah, this looks familiar from shows. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. But attorneys always have access to their clients either through video monitoring or through one of these... Uh, Vestibule. So they can meet over video? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Do they do that in that room? Um, no, they'll do that in front of, let's see if we can find one. We don't have one of those monitors in here. Uh, when we get into another cell, I'll show you the monitors where they can talk to their attorney through those. The only, the, the only part that really sees a lot of wear and tear is that booking area. The rest of the facility looks like this pretty much all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, down this corridor, you'll have five, actually six housing units. Um, I'm sorry, five. They're all exactly the same. We go upstairs, we'll have five more housing units, but they're double tiered. So we'll peek into one of these and then I'll take you upstairs to one of the double tiered units. And then we'll also go into the, the, um, the, the medical observation unit so you can see where we keep the people who are uh, very much struggling with life right now. So. Oh. And you can let the door close behind us, we'll get out. Oh, interesting, so this is a pod. This is a pod. So out there is just corridors to connect. So we have five of these identical so this will hold 22 inmates above us the the housing units above us are designed exactly like this but they're two-tiered and they'll hold 42 inmates. okay so again the same the cells are all exactly the same two man cells or two person cells i should say um bathroom and then showers or uh, communal showers they have a, a, a rec yard and a classroom at the end of the housing unit i can show you that so you see um, kind of what their creature comforts are while they're in the facility okay what percentage of the time are they in their cell? Um, so that's a trick question right now because of COVID. Uh, with COVID, we've had to do social distancing and keep people in cohorts so the inmates don't get as much out, out time from their cells because we have to make sure they're not cross-contaminating with each other and risk the spread of COVID throughout the facility. So right now, they're getting maybe four hours out of their cell in a 24-hour day, maybe six. It just depends on how many inmates are in a particular unit. Um, during the height of COVID, they were basically getting about an hour or two a day mm -hmm. outside of their cell, again, because our numbers dictated that to keep people away from one another, the only way we could do that is keep them behind a closed door. So in a housing unit, this is recreation. Really? So we give them access to a, a unit where they can run around, they can do push-ups, they can do jumping jacks, burpees. We don't provide them any gaming equipment tennis balls, basketball hoops, any of that stuff, because again, it's jail. Uh, our goal here is to give them an outlet to spend some energy or expend some energy, but I'm not, I, I don't feel it's a jail's job to help make a person, um, you know, super criminal, help get them all bolstered up with weights and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we removed weights from our facility in the mid nineties. 
and we haven't reintroduced it. So anything that a person wants to do to get healthy, they can do out here through calisthenics. They can blow off some steam, but this is a rec yard. And how many people on average, or how long are, are inmates usually here on average? So pre-COVID, the, uh, the average length of stay inside the Weld County Jail was about 22 days. Since COVID and the shutdown of the courts and everything else, we're creeping up between 36 and 38 days that a person will stay in jail, and that's all based on how fast they can process through the criminal justice system. If the courts aren't working, then that drives how long a person's gonna sit inside my facility. It's not good for public safety, um, but that's the reality. What you want is that average length of stay to be as short as possible, because that means they're being processed, they're either being returned to the community, they're being dealt with in court, or they're being sent to the Department of Corrections. Hmm. When that when that number creeps up, that's a huge cost to the taxpayers, and it shows you an inefficiency in the criminal justice system. A big distinction between a jail and a prison is programming. Um, like I told you before, we only have the inmates in custody for a short amount of time, maybe a month. You know, they say it takes 21 days to create a new habit. Well, if we have them just that long, trying to break lifelong cycles is pretty tough, but we do the best we can. We offer programming, uh, church services, whatever, uh, whatever we can do to try to rehabilitate inmates um, because we don't want them to come back. We really, we'd rather not see them. So we provide classroom opportunities. The inmates can, can attend as they choose. You can't force someone to, to integrate into a program. We can offer it as much as we'd like, but um, unfortunately, the attendance in a lot of that is pretty low. And uh, when you sit down and talk with the inmates, most of them will tell you they've chosen the lifestyle uh, and until they choose to get out of it, they don't really plug into a lot of this stuff. Yes. And then you guys asked a question about vid video monitoring. Uh, if they wanna do a video visit, either with a loved one or with their, their attorney, they do those from those kiosks. And do they um, have to pay for the calls? The so uh, a call to a family member is a pay call, yes. The, the family member pays on their end. And that's because we don't provide this service, the taxpayers don't provide this service, mm -hmm. the inmates pay for it through contacting their loved ones. With an attorney, there's no charge. Okay. You can look into the housing units and see what's going on before you go in. So if there's a riot situation or um, you know, a fight or whatever, you can at least get a glimpse of what's going on inside of that housing unit before you actually make entry into it. That's pretty rare that something like that would occur, but that's a piece of technology we added that we didn't have sure. in some of the older wings, just so that we can keep a better eye of what's going on. So this is uh, a double tiered unit, exact same layout. You just got two floors worth. So the classrooms in the back are the same, the gym in the back is the same. We can just hold more inmates, um, like I said, 42 instead of 22. So it just gives us a little more flexibility if our population numbers start creeping up. We can put more inmates in here and still only dedicate one officer to, to monitor what's going on. Got it. And is that an outdoor area? It's just like the one downstairs. Oh, it is. It's yeah. just sunny. Yeah, it's or just light. Yeah, so it'll be a little taller because this is a two-tiered oh, unit. Oh, okay. But it's exactly the same. It's just okay. a concrete room. Yeah, they do their own laundry. We don't do their laundry for them. Uh, once we give them their initial stuff, uh, they get their orange jumpsuit and their undergarments. They get to launder them. Uh, basically every two days so we give them enough clothing that they don't have to do them every day but they're on a schedule and they wash their own stuff the only thing that we wash is the bedding or when a person books out we launder all of their uh, mm -hmm. all of their stuff for the next guy coming in okay unfortunately people um, the general public doesn't have a, an understanding of the types of people we get inside of our facility we get people that are sometimes very self-destructive, self-harming, and so you put them into an environment where you minimize that to the greatest extent possible. This would be one of those environments. It's on camera. Um, there's, no, there's nothing really in here that a person could hurt themselves with. They have very basic needs, a mattress, and that's it. Um, the idea is we try to get them through that mental health state. Unfortunately, the use of a cell like this is gonna be very difficult in the coming years because of a house bill that was just passed. And it will actually cause the person who would end up occupying something like this to probably be in greater danger because we have to figure out now how to facilitate that person out in an open air unit uh, until they hurt themselves again or potentially hurt another person because of the desire to get rid of what they call restrictive housing. If we have a person who is hurting themselves, hurting others, biting flesh, doing whatever, 
Um, you have to take pretty extreme measures to protect them and everyone else around them. This is one of those measures, and it's a tool that is not used very often, but it, when it's used, it's very necessary, and this will become um, almost impossible for us to use for a lot of those people that truly need to be in this, this situation. Wow. That's kind of sad, but uh, it's reality. So this is our, what we call our close watch unit. There's actually 15 cells. So we co-located uh, 15 different cells. Um, in the past, we had only had about three or four available to us for the whole facility. But because of the growing mental health crisis in the state of Colorado, we are the de facto mental health facility, um, the biggest de facto mental health facility in the county by far. Um, anywhere between 30 to 50% of our inmates um, either have a diagnosed mental health condition or they're self-reporting a, a mental health condition that's also sometimes masked by drug use. So when a person comes here, they're typically not at their best, they're at their worst. And so this is where, if we're having to triage someone who's in a really bad mental state, this is where they'll start. So someone who has suicidal ideations or self-harming behavior, they start here and then we try to transition them out of here back into a normal population. You know, they may be going through a competency issue and trying to establish whether or not they're even competent to stand trial. Um, this is one of those things that you wish you didn't have to have this kind of housing unit, but because of the failures of the, the state health system, this is, this is where the burden lies. This is a very expensive uh, housing unit, or very expensive proposition to run. Um, we spend about $5 million a year in medical expenses, and most of that is mental health issues, not physical health issues. Mm -hmm. So again, this is the, uh, the other 10 cells. You'll see there's a dividing wall here because mental health issues aren't limited to one gender or another. Um, we may have males on one side, females on the other. Obviously, we wanna try to keep sight and sound separation from them, so hence the, the wall in the middle here. But you would sometimes have a mixed population. Uh, again, with our numbers being as down as they are, uh, right now we're not having to use this unit but I suspect if you come back in two weeks, uh, we will have this populated. Interesting. These, the, there are persons in this facility that are needing this kind of treatment right now. We just have them in other parts uh, because the numbers aren't high enough to, to warrant opening this, this entire housing unit. Okay. How many physicians or medical folks are on staff? Sure. Uh, again, we have a medical contract with an outside provider. So we'll have RNs and LPNs here, and then we have a doctor who spends about 40 hours a week here, uh, give or take a few hours, depending on what's going on in the facility. That doctor is not 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, he's here on a limited basis. And then the RNs kind of share information back and forth uh, with that doctor to try to make sure we keep everyone's medical needs in check. And Sheriff, we talked a little bit about this before we re started recording, but what's the maximum number of prisoners you can have in the jail? So right now I'm just shy of 1,500 beds uh, available. And again, that would be using every overcrowding uh, opportunity available. So we would, we would definitely be full at that point. Uh, we're running with about 630 inmates right now. And we're seeing a lot of scary stats out there, mm -hmm. rising crime rates, even murder, grand theft auto, what, yes. you name it. What can we do as um, just plain citizens in our neighborhoods sure. to um, keep an eye out or to protect our, our neighbors and ourselves? Well, I think the number one thing is you, if you see a crime, you have to report the crime. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement can't get in front of it until they know it's occurring. And unfortunately, and a lot of times things go unreported and, and it gets reported two or three hours after the fact. It's really hard for us to make headway there. Uh, but the best thing you can do is, is urge your state legislators to actually be engaged in, in doing what helps public safety, not what harms public safety. We've seen a, a very bad trend over the last couple of years uh, you know, where cops have been vilified. And I can tell you there's no cop who's itching to go out and handle a call. But if we have support, we'd at least like to have the opportunity to go out and fix problems in the, in the community. Um, you know, I, I guess one other piece that I'll hit on is the, the state of Colorado right now is in, a, is in a transition away from public safety. And in a time where we are probably experiencing the highest crime rates we've seen, the last thing we can do is keep emboldening prisoners and inmates to go out and reoffend. We have to have truth in sentencing in this state. And if people don't understand what that means, if a person goes to jail or gets sentenced to prison for six years, that should mean six years, not two years. Mm -hmm. 
how can people get engaged with their local sheriffs or local police department? Is there anything we can do to support them? <laughs> well, I would say it's always good to, to call into the sheriff's office and get to know your, mm -hmm. your local sheriff, your local police chief. The last thing you want to do is get to know them on the end of a 911 yeah, call. Yeah, that's so, good, good point. You know, be proactive. Go out and, and ask what you can do to help the community. Uh, I have a lot of people that, that do volunteer work at the sheriff's office. We, and we embrace that. We love having them here. Uh, we have a big volunteer corps, and I think most police agencies and most sheriff's agencies would love to have that, uh, especially if it's citizen-driven. So there's always a way to engage. You, sometimes you have to be a little more pushy, but, uh, you know, if you tell the cops you want to be there to help them, you, normally they'll take the help. That's great. Thank you so much for spending some time yeah, with us bet. and walking us through the jail and talking to us a little bit about how we can keep our neighborhoods safe and support our law enforcement officers in our community. Well, thanks for doing this. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of people that take the time out of their day to come see what a jail looks like. It's been very interesting. I've learned <laughs> a lot and had some very curious questions answered. Hopefully the Heidi's Colorful Colorado audience will agree. Thank you for joining us today on Heidi's Colorful Colorado. If you enjoyed this conversation, don't forget to rate, review and subscribe and definitely follow me on instagram to keep up with my latest adventures in the meantime happy trails from me heidi ganahl